In 1871, Tchaikovsky spent the summer with his relatives in the country. To entertain the children, he wrote a little ballet which was given the name The Swan Lake. Four years later, the Imperial Theatre in Moscow asked him to write a ballet on the same theme, and he made use of the music that he had written for the children. He wrote to Rimsky-Korsakov in 1875 and said, I accepted the work, partly because I want the money, but also because I have long had a wish to try my hand at this kind of music. Tchaikovsky found his models in the French ballet music that he loved. He especially esteemed the ballets of De Libes and wrote in the autumn of 1877. I recently heard De Libes' masterly music for the ballet Sylvia. The Swan Lake is small stuff compared with that. Nothing has charmed me so much in these last years as De Libes' ballets. The story of Swan Lake is one of a beautiful maiden, Odette, and her companions, who've been transformed into swans by an evil sorcerer, von Rothbart. Each midnight, they may resume their human form, but when day breaks, they become swans again, until the faithful love of a man breaks the spell. As the ballet opens, a group of swans glide over the lake, and as they reach the shore, turn into young girls. Young Prince Siegfried, while hunting with his friends, encounters the lovely swan girls at the side of the lake and immediately falls in love with Odette. He swears eternal faith, and Odette warns him that she and her companions must die if he breaks his vow. At the court ball, Prince Siegfried is tricked by von Rothbart into breaking his vow. Odette, in despair of Siegfried's betrayal, decides she cannot live without him. She embraces Siegfried and throws herself into the lake. And the prince follows her. By this sacrifice, he breaks von Rothbart's spell, and he and the Swan Queen are united.
In 1891, Tchaikovsky was invited to compose the music for a ballet based on The Nutcracker and The Mouse King, a version by Alexandre Dumas of a tale by E.T.A. Hoffman, whose work also inspired the ballet Coppelia. The composer knew the story well, but was not pleased with it as a subject for a ballet. Nevertheless, he started to work on it. He conceived the idea of making use of the celesta, a small new piano-like instrument for the dance of the sugar plum fairy. He even asked his publisher not to let anyone see the instrument, so that Rimsky-Korsakov or Glazunov, who knew nothing about it, could not make use of its effect before he did. The Nutcracker is a Christmas ballet and one of dancing's most beautiful gifts, not only for children, but for all those who appreciate magic in the theatre. The ballet opens with a family Christmas party for a little girl and boy, Clara and Fritzi. Each guest brings a present, and the one Clara likes best is a nutcracker in the shape of a doll. When the party's over and the family has gone to bed, Clara dreams that the nutcracker doll comes to life and takes her to fairyland with him. In the ballet, toys come to life and a tremendous battle is in progress between toy soldiers and an army of mice. The Nutcracker heads the toy soldiers and, just when it seems that the mice will win out, Clara hurls her slipper and kills the mouse king. The Nutcracker is at once transformed into a Prince Charming who takes Clara to his Kingdom of Sweets, where a great festival is to be held in her honour. She is entertained by the Sugar Plum Fairy and all the toys display themselves, each in its own dance. Thank you. 
Après Midi d'une femme, a symphonic poem by Claude Debussy, was first performed in 1894. This was the composer's first work to show the full and true characteristics of Impressionism. The work was inspired by a poem by Stefan Malam, one of the symbolist poets who sought to use rhythm and the sound of words with something of a musical effect. When the curtain rises, we see a fawn on a hillock idling away a hot summer afternoon. A group of seven lovely nymphs on their way to bathe in a lake nearby enter the fawn's domain. The fawn has never seen such beautiful creatures before and climbs down from his hillock to observe the naiads with the golden hair more closely. The nymphs, in turn, are astonished by this creature, who seems to be a handsome boy, spotted like a goat, with small horns growing from his forehead. Soon, as the playful fawn leaps about them, the startled nymphs flee to the forest, all except one. This nymph is less embarrassed than her sisters and more anxious to discover the fawn secret. The fawn is emboldened to make playful, amorous gestures. The nymph allows him to touch her. She seems to respond to him, but then she eludes his grasp. She's frightened and rushes off to join the others. A silken scarf from her garment falls to the ground. The fawn, no longer playful, is sad at her departure. He picks up the scarf and holds it as if it were a treasure. He returns to the hillock where he holds the scarf in his hands as if it were a woman's face and touches it tenderly. With his possession of the scarf, the fawn is content with his afternoon reverie. It is as if the nymphs had never appeared and as if he had dreamed of their presence and in his dreams possessed the most beautiful of them all. Debussy's music exactly reproduces this atmosphere of vague unreality. In it, we feel the warmth of the sun, smell the fragrance of the wood and the flowers, and hear the fawn as he struggles with his problem. The whole work is sheer atmosphere, at the end of which one feels that he has experienced some strange dream.
Petrushka is a ballet composed by Igor Stravinsky in 1911. It is a ballet in one act, four scenes. The story was devised by the composer and Alexandre Benoit, the painter. Michael Fokin did the choreography and the chief roles were interpreted by Nijinsky and Kasavina. The ballet has since passed into the repertory of all the great companies. The story is set in a public square in St. Petersburg during the celebration of the Russian Easter. An old magician presents his puppet show in the marketplace before the wondering audience. By his magic, he's given the three puppets, Petrushka, a dancer and a blackmore, human feelings and passions, and a tragedy is played between them. Petrushka, unattractive and ridiculous in appearance, suffers bitterly when the dancer rejects his love and falls into the arms of the stupid and brutal Blackmore. Crazy with jealousy, Petrushka gets into a terrible argument over the dancer. While the fair in the marketplace is at its height, piercing screams are heard from the puppet theatre. For while the puppets are performing, the Blackmore gets out of the magician's control and strikes the clown with his sword, killing him before the eyes of the horrified onlookers. The old magician calms the crowd by telling them that, after all, Petrushka, the Blackmore and the dancer are only puppets made of wood and sawdust. The crowd has begun to disperse, when to his horror, the magician is stopped by a cry. It is Petrushka's spirit calling out from the rooftop of the puppet theatre. 